Greetings, fellow learners. Now, before we get into this riveting world of RAG, I have a thought-provoking question for you. What problems have you seen in ChatGPT or other LLMs? Now, for me, they would probably have to be, in general, hallucinations, where LLMs would state some facts that are blatantly incorrect. We'll see in this video how said hallucinations can be mitigated with RAG, but turning this question over to you, what problems have you seen in your day-to-day -day interactions with LLMs? I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. Now, this video is going to be divided into three passes, where in the first pass, we'll start with an overview, followed by some details, and then get into some advanced RAG architectures for pass three. It's going to be a fun video, so let's get to it. To start pass one, let's actually just start with a definition over here from Google. So RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation is an AI framework that combines the strengths of traditional information retrieval systems, such as databases, with the capabilities of generative large language models. And by combining this extra knowledge with its own language skills, the AI can write text that is more accurate, up-to-date, and relevant to your specific needs. Now, in order to illustrate this, let's take an example. So let's take a large language model like ChatGPT. And without RAG, essentially the input is going to be something like, let's just say, which planet comes closest to the Earth. And it's just going to use this as a prompt in order to generate an output which in this case, Mars comes closest to the Earth. Now, an issue with this is that it's incorrect. Mars is not the closest planet to the Earth, it's Venus, and this is a good example of the large language model hallucinating. Now, how can ChatGPT get this right? Well, we can use RAG. So RAG, as we know, is an AI framework, which is from our definition. And this AI framework is going to combine the input prompt, which is which planet comes closest to the Earth. It's then going to perform three stages, that is retrieval, augmentation, and generation. So in the retrieval phase, it's going to use these data sources in order to get some contextual information. Then using this contextual information, it's going to augment it to the context. So you can see some of the information that we got was Venus is 24 million miles from Earth. And another piece of information we got was that Mars is 34 million miles from Earth. Now, we combine both the question along with this contextual information in order to construct the full prompt. And this full prompt is now passed into this AI system that is ChatGPT with the RAG framework in order to generate a new prompt. And this new prompt says that Venus is the planet that comes closest to Earth, which is correct. So coming back to our definition, you can kind of see how we can use databases along with large language models we can combine them together to get the extra knowledge, the extra context, such that the responses are more accurate, up to date, and are relevant, and hence could somewhat mitigate hallucinations. Quiz time. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. What's the difference between LLMs that use RAG and those that do not? A. RAG adds more information to the user input to generate the prompt. B, RAG can slow down processing the user input considerably. C, RAG can speed up processing the user input considerably. Or D, RAG can degrade output performance considerably. Note that multiple options may be correct, and I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answer is A, but can you tell me why? Give your reasoning down in the comments below and let's have a discussion. And if you think I do deserve it at this time, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. 
Now that's going to do it for quiz one and pass one of this explanation, but keep paying attention because I will be back to quiz you. Now for this pass, let's actually go through some details of RAG. And in order to do so, I'm pulling up this paper, which is a survey on RAG that shows RAG from its fundamentals to some more advanced concepts. And this is the primary source for this video, so I'll link it down in the description. And what we want here is now this diagram, which we're gonna be walking through step by step. So first we have a user. They're going to input a specific query. They're gonna ask a query. And this query in this case is, how do you evaluate the fact that OpenAI's CEO, Sam Altman, went through a sudden dismissal by the board in just three days, and then was just rehired by the company, resembling a real life version of Game of Thrones in terms of power dynamics? So this is the question that the user inputs. Now, without any RAG, this would simply be passed to the LLM and it would be made to generate a response. In this case, it says that I am unable to provide comments on future events. Currently, I do not have any information regarding the dismissal of any rehiring of OpenAI's CEO. So this is something that we used to see a lot with the original ChatGPT 3.5 release in 2022, where it would give prompts like, I've only been trained on data until 2022, so I cannot give you the answer. It would either give that response or it would give you an actual response, but it would be a complete fabrication of the truth, AKA it would be hallucinations. Now, in order to mitigate these hallucinations, we can incorporate RAG. But before I walk through the RAG processes here, it probably is more prudent if I explain what's going on with indexing, chunks, and vectors in this section over here. So let's talk about that real quick. So right now we have this component, which is a chunker, and the source of this data is going to be some database, or it could be like a multitude of databases. These databases just have like raw text data. So here's an example where it has like, you know, a stream of sentences. Venus is 24 million miles from Earth. It is also the planet with the hottest atmosphere. This is somewhere in the middle of a stream of text that's present within this database. Now the role of this chunker is that it's gonna take this data and then it's going to break it down into chunks. Now these chunks can be broken down in many ways. So in this first case, we're breaking it down via sentences. So one chunk could be Venus is 24 million miles from Earth. The second chunk could be that it is also the planet with the hottest atmosphere. Now, we can construct different chunking strategies with this chunker. This one just happens to be chunking by sentences, which has its advantages and disadvantages. So one advantage of chunking by sentence is that it's good for getting very precise pieces of information, like Venus is 24 million miles from Earth, super precise, and if that's encoded into some vector representation, we can just fetch that directly. But a negative of this is that it's bad for creating chunks with incomplete context. So for example, it is also the planet with the hottest atmosphere. On its own, the sentence doesn't make too much sense because what is it over here? It, it refers to Venus, but we don't know that since it's on its isolated chunk. And so if we were to vectorize this chunk, which will come later on, the entire meaning is not going to be encapsulated very precisely. And this could be a source of bad predictions and hallucinations later on. Now, another chunking strategy is, of course, using a sliding window approach. So in order to illustrate this, I just added a couple more, like a sentence before and a sentence after the input. So this would be the sun is a hot ball of fire. And after all of the input that I said, Mars is 34 million miles from Earth. Now, this is four sentences, and if we were to chunk this with a sliding window approach, we're basically going to take each sentence, and we're gonna take the sentence before it and after it to provide a full context. So we see the first three sentences in this first chunk, then sentences two, three, and four will be present in this chunk. And a good thing here is that it's a very simple chunking strategy, and it also provides the relevant context that's needed. And so we have this chunker that we can create. 
So now that we have a chunker to chunk input data from a data source, we need to take these chunks and now convert it into some vector that encodes meaning. And this is gonna be done with this vectorizer over here. So this vectorizer could be anything, and typically it's a BERT-based model or some attention-based model these days. And assuming that, we're just gonna assume that this BERT-based model or attention-based model is completely trained. And what it's going to do is it's going to take in a sentence or just some chunk of data, like in this case, the sun is bigger than the earth. And it's going to create some vectorized representation of that data. A vector is going to be a set of numbers that somehow represents this data. And similarly, we can take other chunks and just in similar ways encode that data into different vectors, like so. And these vectors are embeddings as they encapsulate some meaning of this input. Now, what we can do then is we have this vectorizer. We can basically take it for every single chunk in our data store that contains all knowledge. We take all of those, convert them into vectors, and then we can place them into an embedding space. So an embedding space is going to be this multi-dimensional space that has individual vectors. And each of these vectors, as we showed, represents individual chunks. In this case, they're just sentences, but they can just be chunks depending on how we define chunks. And the cool thing about embedding spaces is that the closer that these chunks are together in actual meaning, the closer will be their actual vector representations. And so we can store these vectors in an index and then they can be used for fast nearest neighbor lookups. And also as a quick note, to understand a little bit more about this vectorizer, its architecture and how it can be trained on natural language problems like natural language inference um, in order to actually convert each sentence into a vector, I highly recommend you watch this video on sentence transformers right here because it gives you the complete rundown. Now coming back to this figure, you can see we talked about chunks, we talked about vectors, we talked about embeddings, we talked about indexing. Now let's see how it plays a role right here in this entire RAG architecture. So before even a single query is asked, we take first all of the documents, we'll perform chunks in order to logically chunk them into separate either sentences or based on content or just using a sliding window. Each of these chunks of sentences or words are going to be encoded into a vector representation so you can see that each of these rectangles represents like a vector, some numeric representation of a chunk. These are then fed into an index so that they can be referenced quickly. And we can also compute like nearest neighbors based on a query vector, which we will talk about very soon. Now we have a user. They're going to write some prompt and this is going to be the query. But now this is just like a string of text and computers understand numbers, not words. So we're going to convert this string of text into a single vector representation that represents its meaning. And we can do this by passing it into our vectorizer or our embedding model. So we'll pass it into the same embedding model that we use to create all of these vectors in order to get a query vector. Now what we can do is we have an index as well. So we'll take that query vector pass it into our index in order to get the nearest neighbors. In this case, we're gonna get, let's say the nearest three chunks of data. So the nearest three chunks are Sam Altman returns to OpenAI as CEO, Silicon Valley drama resembles the Zen Huan comedy. Chunk two, the drama concludes Sam Altman to return as CEO of OpenAI, bored to undergo reconstruction. And then chunk three, the personnel turmoil at OpenAI comes to an end. Who won and who lost? All of these three chunks are the most relevant. Now we can then take the query vector, which is the question. We can then take our top three chunks in order to add more context. And then we then pass this into the LLM in order to generate a response. 
And with the response, it says, this suggests significant internal disagreement with OpenAI regarding the company's future, direction, and strategic decisions. All of these twists and turns reflect the power struggles and corporate governance issues within OpenAI. So essentially, it gave us a very relevant answer with up-to-date, most recent information because we were able to appropriately augment context from our data source over here. So this is an overview of the entire RAG pipeline, and I hope these details make a lot of sense. Quiz time. It's that time of video again. Have you been paying attention? Let's quiz you to find out. Which of the following is an example output of an LLM hallucinating? A. Banana is a berry. B. Eiffel Tower is a landmark in Italy. C. Sam Alton was born Taiwanese. Or D. The United States was founded in the 18th century. Note here that multiple options also may be correct, and I'll give you a few seconds to answer this question. The correct answers are B and C, but can you tell me why? Give your reasoning down in the comments below and let's have a discussion. That's going to do it for quiz time and pass two of this explanation, but keep paying attention because I will be back to quiz you. Now, for this pass, in the past we looked at more naive architectures with naive RAG, but I wanted to introduce more advanced RAG architectures, what they are and why they're actually helpful. So let's get to it. So we sort of started with the naive RAG where we have a user, they write a query, then we also are going to take our data sources, we would perform some chunking, we then create vectors, create an index from these vectors so that we have a easy way to access stored data. So when we have a query that comes in, we can fetch the nearest neighbors or the best chunks in order to get the relevant context. We then combine the question and the context to create a prompt. This prompt is then fed into an LLM and then we can generate a response. So that's the naive architecture of RAG. But the problem here is that this RAG can still hallucinate. It can still create responses that may be fictitious. Some points of failure or why this happened is because, well, for one, the query could have just been poorly written by the user. Or two, it could have just been that the context fetched during the indexing phase is also poor quality. So given these two issues, we can try to mitigate hallucinations via a more advanced RAG architecture. And advanced RAG kind of deals with these two issues of poor query writing and also poor quality context fetched by introducing a pre-retrieval phase and a post-retrieval phase. So in order to enhance the user's query, we commit this pre-retrieval phase over here. And zooming into this diagram, we can see that it involves query routing, rewriting, and expansion. So we would take the user's query, and query rewriting essentially means that we're correcting grammatical and punctuation mistakes that happen within the query. Query expansion means that there are certain pieces of vocabulary that are used in the user query. Like for example, we might use the word car in the query, but in all of our documents, which are written in a very different and potentially more formal way, it's going to replace car with something like vehicle or automobile, for example. And in this way, we can actually see better similarity with the query and also more relevant documents being fetched. So this is how we can potentially clean up the query. Now, also a part of this entire pre-retrieval is improving the quality of the context that's fetched. Now, if the context fetches poor quality, it can mean two things. One, the quality of the indexing that is like getting the nearest neighbors is poor. Or two, the quality of the chunking in these documents is poor. Or three, it could be a combination of both two. And so to improve the quality of the nearest neighbor chunks that are fetched, one thing we can do is improve the chunking strategy. 
So instead of just using a simple sentence-based chunking strategy, we can use a more intelligent chunking strategy. This can include a sliding window approach to gain more context, or just some, we can chunk based on topics. So every time there's a switch in a topic, we can just segregate that chunk. And this could be powered by maybe some attention-based model if we want to get a little bit fancy with it. Another thing like we mentioned before is we can also improve the indexing strategy. Aside from approximate nearest neighbor indices that Spotify historically used a while ago, we can use hierarchical indices like in HNSW or maybe some other indexing strategy in order to fetch results quickly and also more accurately. So improving the index strategy, improving the chunking strategy, and improving and rewriting and transforming the query written by the user, all of this can encapsulate just better construction of our prompt in the pre-retrieval phase. Now, post-retrieval phase is going to have three parts, and for each of these, we're going to explain what they are and why they are required. So first is re-ranking. So what re-ranking is, is that for the 10 chunks that may have been fetched due, during the indexing phase, we want to arrange them such that they are truly ranked better. That means the first chunk or the most appropriate chunk is present towards the top of the prompt, and then the least relevant chunk is present towards the end of the prompt. So that's what it is. This is likely required because when we are fetching the nearest queries from the index or the nearest chunks from the index, this is typically an approximation strategy and it's done to optimize response times, making sure that they're as small as possible for real-time systems. But because of that, it might not be the most accurate in terms of the ordering in which the nearest neighbors actually exist. And hence, some re-ranking could actually help improve the quality of the eventual prompt that's generated. And so we would re-rank our chunks such that the most relevant is on the top and the least relevant is on the bottom. And this could actually be cosine similarities with the query and every single individual chunk. And we would re-rank by cosine similarity, for example, or we can get more complex than this and have this attention-based model that will take as an input the query and an individual chunk and determine a relevance score. And we will order the queries or re-rank the queries by said relevance score. The next phase here is summarization. So now we have an ordered set of chunks from most relevant to least relevant. And now each of these chunks needs to be summarized. So we'll try to make sure that they are compressed individually so that they take up less space. That's what summarization does for each chunk. Now, why do we need it? Well, this is mostly because LLMs, especially the attention-based LLMs that are in prevalence today, typically have token limits. And hence, summarization is very useful. Next is fusion. So at this stage, we have 10 chunks, each of them ordered in relevance and also summarized. Now, fusion could be as simple as simply concatenating each of these 10 chunks into one big context, or it can be a little bit more complicated in which we can take these chunks and we can pass it through like a summarizer, which is again, like probably another attention-based model, which we can summarize this data into a more compressed format that still has the same meaning retained. It's just smaller and hence can fit into our prompt which can be passed to our LLM. And so we have a question along with the summarized context passed into our LLM in order to generate an output. And now because we have now taken the steps to improve the quality of the user query and improve the quality of the prompt itself through pre-retrieval and post-retrieval stages, we can say that the output now will have mitigated or less hallucinations and will provide more accurate, real-time relevant data. So that's a more advanced RAG architecture. Next, we're gonna talk about what this modular RAG architecture looks like. So what it is and why it has any improvements over these other RAG architectures. So modular RAG will take these individual components that you see here, whether it's chunking, vectorizing, indexing, re-ranking, summarizing, fusion, each one of these that we've written over here, 
and you can create individual separate systems or modules that can individually then communicate with each other if and when required. And from this, you can build, let's say, different types of RAG architectures. For example, the naive RAG would simply have just the retrieve process and then just the read process, which involves feeding it into a prompt. Then you can have the advanced RAG, which was rewrite the query, retrieve from database, re-rank the chunks and summarize them, and then fit them into the read, which is put it into the prompt. Then you know, for DSP over here, this could be having like a demonstration phase, which is you pass in a question and answer as like an example input. You can search, especially useful if you have multiple data sources, and then make a prediction on like what the generated output should be. Or you can have the iter ret gen, which will have a cycle of retrieval and read operations in order to further refine the outputs of the LLM to get the most accurate data. So that's all the modular rag. So a good things that come from this are, first of all, is customizability. So let's just say that, you know, a very simple question or a prompt comes in. Sometimes we just don't need all of these models to take action. We just need probably the simple naive rag, which was just, hey, get the user query, maybe get some retrieval documents up here, and then just pass it through the prompt and generate an output, something super simple. This way it's also quick in terms of response time, and it's also just not required in terms of overhead. However, there are some user queries that might be more involved that require more critical thinking or critical reasoning. And it's in those situations where we might use more components. So depending on the user query, we can use different sets of components in order to alter the reasoning for quicker response times. Now, another reason why we want to use a modular rag is maintainability. So in the advanced round, we saw that all of these could have been individual models and they would have been a part of a pipeline of a monolithic system. So like one failure is, can be a little bit tough to determine where and when the failure has happened. Whereas with the modular rag, different components are now can be like separate and isolated from each other. They can be managed separately too. So it's a lot easier to maintain as let's say a service over a long period of time. And having each of these as individual components or modules, we can improve on each of these modules separately and over time. And if we improve all of these separately and over time, this will lead to better user queries, better prompt and context generation, hence better prompt generation and hence lower hallucinations. Quiz time. Ooh, this is going to be a fun one. What improvements does the modular rag have over the naive rag? A, reduced hallucinations due to extra steps of pre and post retrieval. B, increased speed and response times. C, the system can select which components to bypass based on response time. Or D, the system can select components to bypass based on complexity of the question. I'm going to give you a few seconds to answer this question and note that multiple options may be correct. The correct answers are A, C, and D. But can you tell me why? Give your reasoning in the comments below and let's have a discussion. And if you do think I do deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. And that's going to do it for quiz time and pass three of this explanation. But before we go, let's generate a summary. So as a summary, we first took a look at the definition of RAG as an AI framework that combines the strength of databases and LLMs for extra knowledge in order to generate responses that are more accurate, up to date and relevant, depending on specific needs. We also took a deep dive into a naive RAG architecture and compared it to an architecture without RAG, highlighting certain components on indexing, chunking, vectorization, and embeddings. And then we took a look at how, instead of just a naive architecture, we can have more advanced architectures in order to include like a pre-retrieval and post-retrieval phase to mitigate hallucinations, or even a modular design for this entire architecture instead of a monolithic system to better maintain and manage individual components of our RAG system, all to mitigate hallucinations. 
And that's all that we have for today. Now, if you liked this video and you want to know a little bit more about this indexing operation, specifically around how we can convert sentences into vectors that represent meaning, you can check out this video on sentence transformers that I made a while back. It's a pretty good watch. Also, if you do think I deserve it, please do consider giving this video a like because it will help me out a lot. And that's going to do it for now. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.